Side Scrollers is brought to you by you. If you'd like to support the show, head over to patreon.com slash side scrollers. It's time for Side Scrollers on YouTube.com with me, Stuttering Craig. I like movies that have sand in them. Wow. He doesn't like it in his mouth. And producer extraordinaire, Travis Key. I don't like the texture in my mouth. What? And brought to you by you, the G2 community, at patreon.com slash sidescrollers. And now, broadcasting from our homes, it's time for the number one gaming and entertainment podcast on planet Earth. It's time for Side Scrollers. Five, four, three, two, one. Oh, welcome on out to Side Scrollers on YouTube.com and Rumble.com and Twitch.tv. What's going on, everybody? Hey, I'm Stuttering Craig. Welcome to the number one video game and entertainment podcast on planet Earth. It is Side Scrollers. Man, do we got a good one today. I am uh, beyond excited to have our guests on. Legitimately, um, this is the person that uh, probably is most requested to come on the show. And honestly, I one I've been looking forward to talking to probably most since the show has started, which is uh, very, very cool. We have... Uh, a great guest today. Very, very excited. Um, and Blabs and Travis will be uh, joining us from the back end today. Travis is going to be manning the chat, and Blabs will be uh, manning social media. So it's just a good old one on one today as we get going. Uh, so we're going to get right into it. No hard news today. Just jumping right into the interview with a uh, man who started his career over on Game Facts, then moved to IGN and became the big cheese over there, then left uh, to start kind of funny with uh, a bunch of chaps over there, then left there to start where he's at now. It's Last Stand Media, and it's Colin Moriarty. Hello, Colin. How are you, buddy? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm very well. I appreciate it. By the way, that intro, that's more production value than I've seen on any Last Stand show combined in uh, in seven <laughs> years. So well, very well done on that. Uh, listen, that's, that's a old school reference. So Side Schoolers was a uh, uh, podcast I did forever ago. Like it started in 2006, and I brought it back you know, like five months ago. So I figured if I did, I need to bring it back with the full intro and the whole everything. And that's where we're at. So that's yeah, it's it's really cool. Yeah. 2006 is like almost before podcasting in some sense. That's when a lot of the early IGN stuff started as well. By the way, I noticed this when we were talking before the show and I have to say it on the air. Do you wear contacts or is that your natural eye color? I don't remember. uh, This is is my natural eye. You have beautiful eyes, dude. Like I'm not even, I'm not even like, they just work really well on video. I noticed it immediately. You must get that compliment pretty often. It's a very unique color you got there okay uh, so maybe I'm, the lights are just doing it, like your ring lights right but i just wanted to tell you on on the air and you're looking great well thank you i appreciate that i, I do my best to make my eyes look good i guess i mean yeah well i don't know I just, <laughs> it's just something, something i noticed right away well, you're making me blush yeah, you're no making problem. me blush right off the bat well i appreciate that that's that's very nice of you and uh you're looking great too man you're looking sharp looking strong looking uh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> look, look, looking, looking healthy yeah i'm feeling i'm actually in better shape than i've probably ever been in my life but um i started lifting a couple of years ago and doing other things but um but yeah, I still eat like shit and just, you know, something yeah, it's a little bit of a a little bit of A in column B. Man, the diet, the diet's that's a tough one, man. The diet is definitely the hardest part. You can lift all day long and mm-hmm. but and I think that's the thing. As you get older, you, it's it's harder and harder to I remember when I was a kid, you do all these, you know, eat a million slices of pizza, you mm-hmm. go out for taquitos or whatever, tacos, and then you come back in and and you'd be shredded or whatever. And now I'm like 42, I'm old as shit. And then it's I, I want to eat all that same stuff because I've been able to do it in my entire life, and, right. you know, but I can't. So yeah, there are no consequences when you're younger, which was, I, I totally felt the same when I, when I worked at IGN early, t- early on, I started gaining a lot of weight and I was like, why am I gaining weight? And then it's like, cause you're eating the same way you've always eaten and you need to tamp it down. So actually I do one meal a day. I only eat between seven 30 and about 10 at night every day. So, so, so you do the, uh, so you do a lot of, uh, intermittent fasting. Yeah. I intermittent fast for about 22 hours, 21 hours a day. And I have for, for years, but that's, that's only because I know I would eat all day. So I, I eat whatever I want in that time frame, knowing that I can only do so much caloric damage to myself. So I'm appreciative of that anyway. Yeah. Well, see, that's the thing is I'm able to do tremendous caloric damage in just about an hour. So, I mean, I, I would just like, t- it's, it's seven 30, let's go and just start shoving it in my face. You know, I, I have, I have this thing, uh, I, I lack self-control. It's, it's really hard to do. So I do in some ways. Like with my marijuana, for instance. Uh, how, how is that? Like I'm, I'm somebody who's never smoked before. Oh, well, I, I, I know it's I know it's legal for a lot of people mm-hmm. and uh, you know a lot of places in the, in the world. I've never smoked weed before, right? That's interesting. But it's, Good for well, you. I, I don't know. Is it? I, I um, mean, some some people say it has great great benefits. Yeah, I'm able to like I should by right be a burnout 
by how much I smoke, but I just, I'm very OCD and focused and I just, it, it works for me. It helps me tamp down my anxiety and has for many years, but it depends on the user, you know, just like alcohol and other things. Uh, but I, the funny thing about marijuana that you might discover you smoke it is a lot of people that smoke the first time don't get high. Mm -hmm. It takes you a few times before you actually do it. Mostly, I think, because people don't know how to inhale it and, and all of that kind of stuff. But you should. Where where are you? You're in um Dallas. Da I was gonna say you're in Texas. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, probably not the. Well, I'm sure you can get it easily there, but <laughs> I'm, I'm um, sure not, you get not legal. Anywhere, right? Yeah, right. Well, so you know, it's funny because I, I I thought that'd be a fun fun stream. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, I was like, that'd be fun to go to like Colorado or something mm -hmm. and just do do like the first time Craig gets high stream, right? Uh, but I don't know it it. It is intimidating to me. It scares me. It's 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 one of those. I things can understand where... that. I can understand that. It's not intimidating. No, once you get get to know it. But uh, but I think I personally think it's good to keep as many things out of your body as possible. I, I try to limit my vices to marijuana. I don't drink too much anymore and stuff like that. So, and oh, I've good. never done hard drugs or anything. That's not that's not been my scene. So. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, while we're on the topic, you ever like got into like the uh, what was the big one a few a few months ago? I heard about uh, ayahuasca. Oh, ayahuasca. Like, yeah. Aaron Rodgers is the one that's mm -hmm. really been bringing that to the fore no i i've done some psychedelics like mushrooms and stuff but i've never i want to do acid um and some of these other things but you really need to do them in controlled environments but they say it helps you tap into something you know parts of your mind and parts of reality and even if it's not i, I want it they call it a trip for a reason i'd like to go on that trip but i i don't think uh did you watch Mad Men by chance? Uh, weird reference. No, I. But I, I think I know the reference you're getting to. Oh yeah, Roger. Stur R Roger like goes and does acid with a bunch of people, and it's just like so. And, and he's older, and they're all younger. And I, I, I imagine that's the way I'll probably be in the future because I'm 38 now. So you know, in my 50s, I'll go find some young people and do acid with them. Right, right. I think that's the thing that's interesting about the idea for me is they say you know you tap into this extra part of your brain, and, and part of me goes like, what's the back? What's the what's wrong with that that sounds like a really good idea being able to access more of your brain because at the what, what do they say we only access a, a small percentage yeah of small, like some percentage yeah right, right so i don't know it sounds that sounds pretty interesting but um yeah i don't know what, what that's not where i thought we'd start with this conversation but yeah, I'm, okay. I, it, it's interesting i love it i love it <laughs> so you uh you know we, we only got an hour with you which is which is I'm, I'm very excited to chat with you for an hour we we've known each other for a while but we never really mm -hmm. uh hung out or, or talked i mean i say we probably you know, we, we saw each other probably last uh, in Austin, maybe for the rooster teeth thing, maybe. Yeah, we would be down there every so often. And so we'd, yeah, we'd, we'd see you there and at shows. It's been no later than 2017 would probably be the last time I saw you and probably more like 2016, I would say. Right, like that. right, right, right. About the time the internet uh, and uh, the game industry broke pretty much. About yeah, I think Donald, I think Donald Trump. And just the whole, like that whole election cycle, regardless of the outcome, just absolutely broke people's minds. It was, it was amazing to actually bear witness to in hindsight, but um, yeah, it was right in that summer. I think probably it was around the last time. Right. Um, we, uh, I kind of want to go through your career a little bit and, and while going through your career, I wanted to kind of highlight some things that you've said about your career. And, oh, okay. and I, I think side scrollers is a uh, side scrollers is just getting started, but side scrollers is a show that's built around common sense. I feel like there's not a whole lot of common sense used in the gaming space today uh as somebody who has you know been in the gaming space for you know since 2006 right and i left for a short time and i came back and when i came back it was like i looked at the space and i was like it was like just absolute burning right it's just like this place is insane it's it was insane when i left but it's even more insane now right um i uh, i was going through a lot of your interviews that that you've done um <laughs> yeah. recently and uh, I, and I, I wanted to kind of pull up some quotes that you had that you had said. And um, we were talking specifically about um, uh, diversity in the gaming space. And uh, this was a reference that you had. You were actually talking with uh, David Jaffe. Oh. and and uh, you know David Jaffe's become a, a regular guest on the uh, on your on your shows yeah oddly we've become like person good personal friends which is which is strange you know I, i've always i've known him for many years but um like we've become friends like boys which is which is you know you never think when you're i was you know right. young playing twisted metal or god of war that you'd be david jaffe's friend but yeah there it is <laughs> well it, it, i mean it's pretty cool right but yeah it's what, awesome what's interesting about it i mean it's not interesting but it's interesting today because that that you guys are you don't align with a you know, you're not parallel in everything in your life and you have differences and people today see that as insane, right? How can you talk to this person? How can you talk to Colin? How can you talk to David? Whatever. Um, but I wanted to kind of, kind of 
key po- key on uh, a comment that you made. I thought it was really fascinating and a really good comparison that you made uh, and kind of dig into this a little bit more. Um, you were talking about um, just diversity in, in, in the gaming space as a whole. And I wanted to kind of highlight this comment. Well, I always use is like go into a 30 people in, in IGN and be like, oh, who likes RPGs? And 10 people raise their hands. And who likes sports games? And seven people raise their hands. And uh, who voted for Trump? Who who's a conservative? Who believes in who's pro-life? You know, like right. who who comes from a red state? You know, right. like it's it's and that's the thing. Like that's where I think that the essence of diversity is. That is sure. to me the essence of diversity. So I thought that was like a really interesting comment. And as somebody who um, I've you know I've worked with a lot of companies that are primarily on. Uh, the coastal companies, your San Francisco's, your, your LA's, mm. your New York's, right? Um, I think that's one of the reasons why um, your company uh, and a lot, of, a lot of these companies that are popping up that are seen as, um, you know, alternatives to the regular just shit that's being spewed by, by these other outlets. That's why they work because there's a tremendous lack of diversity in, in each one of these rooms in San Francisco, in LA, in New York, um, that, and that's why you're successful. I, I mean, outside of you're really good at what you do, but you're a great alternative to, to all the nonsense. Oh, thank you. I, I think you're right that that's a major piece of it just because, um, we don't have a political angle per se. We just don't care what your politics are. And that should be, I think enough to be welcoming to people and welcoming to a diverse array, array of, um, of viewpoints. It's interesting because our newest recruit is Gene Park, who's the Washington Post's, um, games critic and he's co-hosting our nintendo podcast and um he and i have become very good friends over the last couple of years and he got a lot of grief when he joined when he started doing shows with us and then when he kind of doubled down and said because i think what he realized and he can tell his own stories but what he realized behind the scenes like in his own mind was like these people have no power they have no audience they're the old guard no one really likes them like I, we talk about kotaku a lot on our right on our show for instance like who earnestly reads that site no that's what i want to know like right. who is earnestly reading it I only see it because people are like, oh, hate clicks and all that. And I'm like, you can't farm hate clicks for money. I don't think people understand how the, the economy works in the, sh- in the mid and long term. You need to you can't go to people and be like, everyone hates our, our website. and We're going to write a piece about Final Fantasy 16. So 100,000 people will see your ad. That's not what they want to be associated with. So I I just look at the constant political haranguing, the constant attack on half or more of the audience and the gatekeeping as far as political, social, and ideological things, I think is really distressing to me. And it has always been. And I'll tell you this. I don't know if you visited us. If we, I, I don't know if I knew you back at IGN, but um, so, someone like Destin would be able to talk to this. Sure. I had a, uh, at my desk at IGN, we all had cubicles. And I had a massive Ron Paul in 2008 sign at my desk the entire time I worked there. And no one gave a fuck. No one said one cross word. I also had an Ob- a, bu- a bumper sticker that said honk if I'm paying your mortgage with an Obama, like the O and honk was like the Obama logo, just like little funny things like that. And no one cared. And in fact, that I was looked at as a unique viewpoint. I was the most read person on IGN. I'm probably one of the most read people on in IGN's history. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if it's necessarily out of talent. Could be. But more like out of just w- being willing to explore and say and do different things than it's. I think you'll agree. It seems like everyone in the industry cares a lot what everyone else in the industry thinks of them. Hundred percent. I yeah. care less, to be honest. Well, and I think that's the thing is is when you don't care about what what everybody else thinks, then you're out of the club, and then you get called, you know, an ist, a phobe, or whatever, mm-hmm. right? And uh, and you you you're subject to these attacks based off of something that you probably didn't even say or just uh, assumptions. And I think that's it's it's almost a, a character assassination mainly because you're not part of the club, you know, uh, because you, because you don't think like them and you're not a part of what they, what they want. So, um, you, you've had, you know, there was a story a few years ago where you had a, uh, a panel canceled at PAX. Mm -hmm. Um, and you, you know, you obviously, you you know, that was very obviously politically driven, Mm -hmm. right. I would imagine, um, we're talking about a company based out of, uh, you know, an an event in Seattle, Mm -hmm. right. Um, and you run by Reed pop, which is an, a very liberal company. Yeah. Right. Right. So how do we, how do we get back to a point of sanity in the space? Or are we long past the point in the gaming space where it's just, it, it's going to run its course and it's going to crash and burn or, or is there, is there, is there a glimmer of hope in the gaming space that could potentially, uh, 
you know, help write the ship, at least when, when I, I mean, in just bringing back diversity of thought. Yeah, I think that, I don't think the hope, is, I think there is hope. I think new shows, new people, people that aren't even born yet probably will be the, the ultimate harbingers of a change. But, um, and maybe will be the inspiration for those people, I don't know. But I think the old media, like the old guard, there's no saving that. And uh, I think that that's clear. They've had, I've said, I've put, the, you can really, I think, relate to this. I put this in the words and we use Kotaku as an example when we talk about this. Imagine, I think about that, the writer over there, Ethan Gock, I think his name is, right? And mm -hmm. he's worked there for many, many years. He's written he, he, hit pieces about all of us or whatever. But he was kind of bestowed upon him a Kotaku that was actually well-read, popular, right. trafficked. And under people like him, they failed. And the people that are in these positions of failure act like it's everyone else's fault but their own, but they don't realize it's them. And when I left IGN, and I remember telling Pear, the best thing you could do is replace me with someone like me. Like, go find someone that that sounds different, but they never did, and that's their loss. And it was, it's a, so if you're not an IGN or a GameSpot and, you, and you're a historical site that can scrape, you know, has incredible Google cache and can scrape and do SEO and all this kind of stuff, you're done. Mm -hmm. And it's not a matter of if, but when Kotaku goes out of business. And oh, yeah, hundred um, percent. And so, I, and it, and frankly, it couldn't happen to a, a group of nicer people. So, um, see, that's the thing that, and some people think it's a, a kind of a bad, bad uh, look for me. But I don't feel bad for any of these people. The, these are these are the same people that tried to destroy my life over nothing, and right. have come at me relentlessly for years, trying to ruin me, ruin my reputation, and all of the rest. So. Watching them sink gives me, gives me, frankly, great glee. I love it. I can't wait. I'll be there celebrating with everyone else when Kotaku goes out of business. And that that's te tells you a lot about the business and the model. And that that's why that's why I wonder like who earnestly reads these places. Right. And, and it's it look, people will look at that and they'll say, is it petty? And my response is like, sure, and rightfully so. Mm -hmm. You know, like did they try to destroy your life? You know, and I think that's the thing that the, so obviously. The, we talked about like the gaming space as a whole, the diversity of thought, but it's also uh, how it's lacking. But um, there's been a divert, there's been a severe lack of diversity of conversation in the gaming space. Uh, people just aren't aren't willing to have conversation uh, anymore. It's like they've they've chosen their sides, and um, you know we can get into the kind of funny side uh, a lot. But the thing that as I watched that happen from afar. The sad thing is, is that I, I very much relate to what happened to you because uh, there's there's a lot of comparisons, right? Um, and mine aren't as public; they weren't nearly as public. But I left a company that, um, for the exact same reason, I was watching an interview. You said one of the big reasons, um, one of the big turning points for you was you refused to uh, apologize for mm -hmm. for your for your tweet. And you stood your ground and you didn't think it was that bad. And it wasn't that bad, right? It was just, you know. And I'm not sorry. So why would I apologize? Right, okay. exactly. And and I had a business partner who, um, you know, obviously during 2020 was was a really crazy year between COVID and uh, George Floyd and everything there. We did a uh, we did a stream where we talked about, you know, uh, George Floyd situation and stuff. And, and my stance was uh, I'm going to treat everybody equally. Right. And I that's how I've been raised. I've been taught to treat everybody the same and and uh, treat everybody with respect until they until they uh, no longer garner respect. Right. Um, and uh, to there was there were some girls who like they were 20 something year old white girls who were out of college and they took offense to that. That's not good enough. So they went to uh, my business partner at the time is like he needs to apologize you know, and they did the the white savior thing where it's like he needs to apologize to everybody because that's not good enough. And I was like, apologize for what? You know, and that ultimately my inability or my uh, because I didn't want to apologize for that. That is why I left that company. Right. And uh, when I heard that, I was like, oh, shit, that's like, you know, that's like the exact same thing. You know um, what? Uh, I don't know. We, we've, we know about I mean, it's six years ago now. It was a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's ancient history. You've seen tremendous success from there. But I, I wanted to pull up another another quote from you um, where you were talking recently with uh, with uh, Michael Malice. Yeah. And uh, I thought this was like, unless you've truly been in this situation, you don't really understand. And I thought that you put this way better than I could possibly put it. Because I think you are, you're like a wordsmith. 
I just kind of ramble, right? Thank you. I appreciate very... that. It's like one of the only things I'm good at. We always make fun of like, I don't know anything that's useful. I can just, I just know video games and I can write well. And that's basically it. So I appreciate that. Thank You're you. very articulate in how you speak. And I, I just kind of mumble out a bunch of words, but you said this very well. And I, 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 I just wanted to say this was phenomenal. And I may be the only one who gets anything out of this, but I appreciate this. When I saw a therapist after it all happened. Okay, good. One of the things I said was... It, you kind of can't help but take it really personally that no one gives a shit. Like no one out there who knew you, worked with you, even lived with you, shared a cubicle with you, traveled with you is being like, whoa, 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 racist? Like what? what did, so that kind of, that silence allows things to become quote unquote real. And I think that's one of the things that bothers me most, most about talking about cancellation is everyone's always like, oh, it doesn't matter. It's, this isn't really happening. And I'm like, what? it matters to the person who it happened to. Right. I appreciate that. And, and like I said, I think for, for me, I've never been able to articulate it that way. Right. And that, yeah, I, you know, me personally, I, I took a lot of the things that, that have been said about me personally. Right. And, you know, you've got it you got it tremendously bad. You know, you, you got booted. I was, I've never been booted from conventions. I've just never even been invited to conventions. Right. Yeah. Oh, uh, I don't get invited to shit, but yeah, I, you know, so. Right, right, right. <laughs> um, you've, you've talked about how you've reached out to, to the kind of funny folks, you know, just out of the idea of you needed to get it off your chest. Uh, what was the response there? Well, yeah. I mean, so I, really the only, I, I've actually talked to Nick and Kevin at various times. So, um, when I sold my shares to kind of funny, they, they, they paid me four times. They owed me four big bursts of money and it was like right away. And then at the end of that year, the end of the next year and the end of the year after that. And I basically was making like my salary plus whatever, 50% for those years or something mm -hmm. to buy out. And it was awesome. I mean, I was really grateful for that, but that required me to keep in touch with Nick to like, you know, um, cause Nick is like kind of the administrator of the business. Um, so we would keep in touch every once in a while. And then I would text him once in a while or they would reach, he would reach out to me once in a while. If someone thought of something, I talked to Kevin behind the scenes every once in a while, but Greg is the one that, you know, Greg and I were, were very, very close. And in, in hindsight, it's kind of a shame that we, and I don't mean this as any, in any disrespect to the others who are, you know, but it, we really should have just done it by ourselves. And you mean, you mean you leaving kind of funny with Greg, right? And no, no, me leaving IGN oh, to okay. make kind of funny with, Sorry, I should be clear with with sure. Greg. Like, and when other people became involved in it, it quickly lost what I thought it was going to be. So that it, like, what Last Stand is now is kind of what I would have had assumed that we would have done with kind of funny. And so, um, but I respect that the, the course that they've taken, and I have tried to keep in touch with Greg over the years. Like when his dog died, who I you know I lived with Greg for almost a decade, so I I basically lived with his dog. Mm -hmm. um but he didn't get back to me on that and i emailed him a, like uh, i saw podcast beyond which is our old show at ign just did i think their 800th or 700th episode or something like that and I, e I emailed him a joke being like how does this show still shambling on it's like incredible we left it like 315 or something but he didn't answer that and it's it's pretty clear that he doesn't want anything to do with me but i was encouraged and i'm not going to like continue to try but i was encouraged by my actually a therapist that i was seeing it's like you got to you got to like let go of the anger and try to just be normal and at least, you know, put out there that you want to bury the hatchet and all that. And you can't really do anything if a person wants to reciprocate or not. And I understand his position, I think, because it wasn't intentional, but I really hurt kind of funny when I left. And I know, I know that in hindsight that I did. And I don't, I don't know that they've, they seem to have kind of just stayed flat. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel bad about that. That was not my intention. My intention was to leave so that they can do what they wanted because it was clear that what I wanted to do and what they wanted to do were different. Well, maybe but, they uh, have and it just hasn't worked. Yeah, I think I don't know how it all works, to be honest, from the outside. Um, like our, my Patreon is substantially bigger than kind of funny has ever done on Patreon. Right. And we have far lower overhead than them. And we don't have a space. We don't have all these things. So I don't really know quite how it works. I think that's part of what really bothered me about working there, though, was the constant endemic advertising, which we don't do on last name. We refuse all money from games companies. Um, and as people know that listen to Sacred Symbols, we don't do PR contact at all. We don't get games early. We don't do anything like that. We don't do go to events. We don't let people pay us for any of that stuff. We only do non-endemic advertising. 
Um, and then the constant like hosting and doing all these kinds of things to bring money and, and revenue in. Um, it seems like the, I don't really understand the economics of it, but I, I don't, you know, I don't know the, co the, co the company's ins and outs anymore. It just doesn't seem the, the aesthetic doesn't seem to match the numbers. And I don't think the aesthetic is necessary. That's, right. that was kind of the biggest thing. I loved working out of my spare bedroom in San Francisco. I, I wish we always just stayed there. Mm -hmm. Um, well, so, you know, yeah, so you, you said something and, and I don't want to, uh, I don't want to floss by this because I don't, I don't want to uh, misinterpret your words. You said you, you felt like it should have been just you and Greg to do it by yourself. And then when other people got, got involved, when you say other people, are you speaking of Nick and Tim? Yeah. Although I don't want to, it sounds like I'm insulting them and I'm really not. I, right. I actually think that Nick in particular played a very important role early on as our, as like our filmer and our producer. Um, and I appreciate all of that. But yeah, it felt like Greg and I, I think, started to kind of like unravel during this era a little bit. And I think it's because um, of the involvement of a lot of other people and personalities and trying to do different shows and trying to direct things without really trusting our instincts about what worked and what didn't. And the reality is that people were there to see Greg and I mm -hmm. um, in the beginning. And that obviously changed over time. But I, I wonder, I think back sometimes... Um, you know, what would what it would have been like if we did things differently, because I do lament the fact that like it makes me sad. It makes me sad. So I do a show Sacred Symbols, which is a PlayStation podcast. It's the third major PlayStation podcast ever in the tether that connects all those shows is me. But it's interesting that like Greg and I really could have kept doing that, maybe even at a higher level together. But it just became too complicated. It became too complex. And mm -hmm. um that's why I just you wonder if like you could have just kept it together in a smaller way. Um, what would have happened as opposed to really believing the hype and believing the energy and then trying to really outpace our growth and really listen to things that aren't true and spend money that we don't need to spend and right. ally ourselves with company we don't need to be allied with and um, and all the rest. And so, yeah, I, I quickly it quickly lost its luster for me because I just felt like we were turning into IGN. And I was like, well, why did I, I could have stayed at IGN, made one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year and just been totally fine. I mean. They got a great know. set. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that, I mean, I'm not, I'm not insulting. Like their aesthetic is awesome. I just You're don't right. understand what sacred symbols does much more traffic than their PlayStation podcast. And we film it out of our, our out of our bedrooms. We don't need. Well, it's authentic, kind of so, right? That's the thing is it's, it goes back to authenticity, right? People care about authenticity online. They care about you. They care about your thoughts on it. They don't care about the backlight and the amazing set. The amazing set is nice for sponsors and advertisers. Look at how professional, look at how shiny this is. But at the end of the day, people see you and they care about you and they care about your thoughts on what's happening on the PlayStation, which is, which makes it, which is why traffic. And that's why you're the common thread. Yeah, perhaps. I mean, it's, it's, I'm honored by that. I mean, the one thing that I'll say is that like, I'm always willing to bury the hatchet with Greg because I just think life is too short and you got to look at the perspective of other people and you got to remember where you've been and you got to remember who's helped you and who's been there. And certainly I was there for him and he was there for me. And so hopefully one day we can at least bury the hatchet, shake hands, even if just digitally or whatever, and just, and move on. But that's, I've, I've long considered that ball no longer in my court. Right. And so, cause at some point it come, it comes off as almost desperate, right? And I'm not, I'm not desperate. I'm just trying to be kind. Um, to, well, to various people that I care about. And, uh, but at some point you got to, you got to accept reality and the other person has to reciprocate. It's like, um, Nikki described it as a divorce in one of his interviews. And I was like, yeah, I, I totally, cause we were like so close and just, we lived together. We worked together. We traveled together. We were, Greg and I were together all the time. And, and we, tr I can't speak for him, but I truly never got tired of him. Mm -hmm. Like, um, we were, we were, we had a special friendship like that. So it's a shame to see it go, but business really does complicate things. And other people really do complicate things and change the way things are looked at. And I also have to take responsibility for my own actions too, in terms of, I was in a pretty dark place, you know, in that, in my, in my life for years really. And Greg did try to help me and tried to encourage me to go see people and do all those kinds of things. But I hadn't yet been medicated when I was like kind of funny. I, I was later, you know, I was, um, I was uh, diagnosed as, you know, really depressed and, um, and have a really bad anxiety and all of that, but that happened afterwards. So some, so you have to also take responsibility or I have to take responsibility for my own demeanor during that time, which was very defeated and not energized about the content as well. So there's a lot to go into it, but like you said, it was a long time ago. It's funny because it almost is like 
fleeting my imagination. Right. Ultimately, I'm going to have to go back to shows like this in 20 years to remember what the hell anything, what, what, what anyone said or what happened at all. Well, let me ask you this. When you, when you go back, and let's say I, I do research for all interviews that we do, and, and I go back and I watch previous interviews because I don't want to like have overlapping conversations, although there will be some, right? What are your thoughts when you go back and I'm, I, you were in the room when this happened uh, and this was the stream that they had. When you hear a statement like this, do you feel that, uh, how do you feel about this? Let me just play this. Today, in the way he handled the situation. I've never been more proud of him today. In the way he handled the situation, the way we talked about it, how, how everything went today. There were so many ways where I was like, this could go fucking a million different ways that would be horrible for everyone involved. And this is the best case scenario. And in literally, I don't know, I don't have his timeline for anything. In, I'll say two years, even, we're all going to look back and be like, this was the best. Because it is going to be that, hey, you're making awesome shit. We're making awesome shit. We all love each other. You still get to come out. We cross over and do, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Do you feel like that's bullshit? going back and watching that now yes but i but i i um i think that when you're in the moment i remember those days that maybe not that specific day but like so at the office that we worked at when we left our apartment we had a you like walked up these stairs and went into the space you might have been there i don't i don't know and um the we had like this rooftop and Greg and I just sat on the roof. San Francisco is literally behind us and, you know, beautiful scenery. And we were just talking and basically breaking up. And and I remember that um, very, very vividly. And that might be re really right after this. When, so you can't really it is bullshit, but it's I don't know that that was the intention. I think that things heavily change. Like if you ask Greg in March of 2017, would you go six years without ever talking to Colin? Right. Uh, basically, I, I think he would say, no, that sounds insane. And he would mean it. But I think the reality, the different things changed. I also think that over time, as people have asked me about it and as I've opened up more about it, I think um, people have started to kind of go back and look at content and see the divisions before they even started to to be there and read into things and all of that. I just, I try not to read too much in that. People bring that conversation up all the time about they were going to invite sure. him back and have him on. And um, I think someone asked me recently, like, what are they going to do for their 10th anniversary? You know, um, are they going to acknowledge you at all? Because even someone showed me a video where they they had some footage of me in one of the videos, but there, it was always bad footage. Like it was a footage of me with like a mic in front of my face, or like where you could mm -hmm. never see my face. And I'm like, it's so, it's so Eddie, strange. It's bullshit. just not my it's not my company anymore. But um, yeah, it's bullshit. I I was, I will say that the way they treated me and alienated me did a long, went a long way to letting everyone else alienate me. Right. When when Greg was willing to alienate me and not come to my defense not that it's his job to come to my defense that was basically the end for me in terms of being in mainstream gaming culture and uh yeah so that's just the way it went do was there a and we'll move past kind of funny in just a second because i i know you know you probably get asked about every interview and you know and i don't want to spend too much time i would rather talk about what you're doing now but was there a moment where you were like yeah it's time was there a specific moment where you remember something was said, something was done, you said something or where you looked at it and you go, okay, it's time for you to move on. Yeah, I think it was, um, the reality is, I remember being very self-conscious about, internally, about what I was doing or how much effort I, it was perceived that I was putting in because Nick and Tim, by virtue of them not really being vital to the content, were doing a lot more of the the kind of grunty business work that mm -hmm. you know I have to do now for my company, and I totally understand that. Um, but I think that I just became over time insecure about the different thing. Like, I don't think I've said this before, but I wasn't really wanted there by one of the people that we founded the company with from the very beginning. He made that very clear to me from the very to beginning. Be clear, are, are you speaking of Tim? Yes. Okay. And I don't mean this to say it, it, to insult him, but that is true. You know, um, why? Well, as I said in the in the beginning, when we agreed to leave IGN, he told me that I shouldn't come. And that I make Greg unhappy and all this. I remember it was in one of the, the, the meeting rooms at IGN. I was really mad. Then I went to Greg and tried to. And he was the one who really turned me around. I'm like, I'll just give my my shares back because we just incorporated. And I'm like, I'll just stay, take my massive raise 
that they're going to give me because I'm threatening to leave. And then, and you guys can go. And he, he kind of talked me out of that. And so we just went to along. Clear, so yeah. just to be clear, the friend that you've had for a long time, mm-hmm. you, you're, you're going to leave with this. Another mm-hmm. guy comes in who is also a friend, mm-hmm. right, at the time, but not nearly as good a friend, says like, hey, listen, you make this other friend uncomfortable. Right. You as a friend say, OK, well, this this won't work out very, you know, this doesn't sound like it's going to work out very well. I'll just hang out here. You guys do your thing and I'll watch from afar and root you guys on. And uh, that's where that's where it was until Greg convinced you back. Yeah, this all happened like in one day, like in meeting rooms. Right. You know, I think I think even one of our conversations happened in like the, the cage where we would keep all of our equipment. And. Um, and his argument was just, yeah, I don't think he ever really liked me and that's fine, but. I think his argument was like, you know, Greg seems to just be unhappy with you or like that, like Greg's unhappy with something about like it just really set it really. And I know I damn well know that Greg must remember that conversation because it really hurt me. In fact, I think I was crying as I remember. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yeah, him, I mean, right, like so, yeah, it's, it's pretty fucked. I mean, it's a fucked up conversation. I mean, and that, I, but but there's more. Right. Because like then you kind of go in with that, that that feeling of like. I'm not good enough. Someone doesn't want me to be here. And then you're kind of at micro like analyzing everything about what you do. Are you doing enough? Are you going to get fucking called out and voted out or whatever? And I just think at the time I didn't realize like how vital I was to the operation. And then I had nothing to worry about that. Like there was, I was being, but, but there were other things that were told, like he later floated to me, the idea of me taking less money than everyone else, you know, um, Tim or Greg, no, Tim. Tim. And that would that happened in the new office that like my pay should reflect like the amount of work or the amount of time or whatever effort or care I put into things. And when I would try to create new things, like I wanted to create a political show on the side and do all these other things like they wanted. They really wanted all of it. You know, they and wanted that was, piece and, of that too. Um, you know, I was even in talks to write a book about PlayStation, like early talk. So I, I've talked to public publishers want me to write a book mm-hmm. and over time i i actually had a contract for a little while to write a book and i abandoned it when i was at ign during those early kind of funny days and there was another lead of writing a book about playstation like the history of playstation which would have been awesome but then i remember being at like the burger shop down the street and them and and being talked about like well like you can do that on the side but like there's all this like because because greg's money for a lot of his hosting gigs were was actually going in the kind of funny and i was really vehemently against that because i'm like that's not our money that's your money you're really greg could really be independently wealthy on his own without doing any of this stuff so you have to kind of give it up to him and i don't know if they do that anymore but that that so what i'm saying is it's like having that hanging over me in hindsight and i really thought deeply about it um that really affected me like knowing from the very beginning and then having those little things like oh take a pay cut oh this oh that it really it makes you be like it makes you really second guess and you know your own value and i've never talked about a lot of that stuff publicly but it's true and it hurt so hmm. So when I, um, I kind of just started to believe the hype. I think I believed, I think in a lot of ways, like their relationship, Greg and Tim's relationship with each other really subsumed mine and Greg's relationship, which is fine because that happens in nature and that that's, but that came with consequences. And, um, I think part of the consequences, Greg just had no patience for me anymore. Um, and again, I take responsibility for my own actions. I'm very moody. I'm very, you know, I'm sure I, I was late sometimes to things and I was definitely I definitely didn't do everything right. I was also in like a really, I was also in like a rebound relationship during that time too, where I was just like completely out to lunch with a lot of that stuff too. So I, I accept all of that, but at the very least there's like a, there's a, um, those things did happen and it did affect me and it would be a lie for me to say that. Like if not for that one person, I probably would have really, 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 really tried to make amends already with them. Yeah. Well, let's, um, Let's put a pin on this, but mm-hmm. I, but before we do, uh, I want, I hate that phrase, by the way, let's put a pin in it. So, that's actually, so, ironically, that's a Greg phrase. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, good. Well, let's do that. And, okay. uh, let's, by the I'm way, I, I, by the way, real quick, sorry, I know you want to move on. No, I, I know you said means... we have an hour together. I actually don't have to record. I know we talked a lot about nothing there, so I, I don't have to record on our own stuff for until two. So, you know, we'll take as much time as you want. You tell me when you need to go. Okay. And, and we'll keep going. But do you feel that, uh, like if, if Greg and Tim and Nick were standing here today, what would you tell them? What what would be a message that you'd have for them right now? I think I would just say that I'm I'm so, that I'm sorry that it hurt them so badly, and I mean that, like from a business point of view. Um, we all have our own interpersonal stuff, 
But I think that that's what I would say. I feel bad about like I really, truly feel bad about that. I remember saying to Greg when I was signing my buyout, I was like, I'm going to regret this one day. And he said, no, you're not. And something like you'll be fine. And this was in our back office. And and uh, and I really thought that they were going to blow up without me. I thought that. And, and for some reason, I, I believed that I was the anchor weighing them down in some way. Like, oh, it's my fucking new york misery and my and they don't want to commiserate with me anymore and all this and i'm just keep i'm holding them back but i think it actually injured them and and kind of stymied their ability to grow at least in that moment and i feel bad about that because that was not the intention i was really proud and i'm still proud to have co-founded that company and um and i think it means something that i that i founded that company but at the same time i know that that it it hurt them and i i I just i I do lament that and i feel bad about that how much of um how much do you feel your political leanings and Tim's political leanings drove a wedge into, into that company? Um, I don't think the politics, uh, Tim's not a political person. So I, I don't think that it had any, uh, maybe he is now, but he wasn't, I mean, he, um, that's, he's not like a social, political, historical. That's like, he's not an academic dude. He's, mm-hmm. he's into like, you know, pop culture and he's deeply knowledgeable about brands right. and he's deeply knowledgeable about movies and all those kinds of things. So, I don't think it had anything to do with that. I just think he didn't really, I mean, in hindsight, I guess he just didn't really like me. And I think that also part of it was probably for care of the star of the show, which is like, what is, what makes this person happiest and best and most content? Um, And yeah. And I think that that was, but I think that there was also from my feeling, I also think there was a need to like, kind of, I, it came across to me as jealousy sometimes that Greg and I were a thing. Right. right? And, and, um, like I remember when when Greg and Tim hosted the Final Fantasy 15 reveal event, that was actually ho- offered to Greg and me first, um, and I was like, I'm not comfortable doing that. I don't want to work for these companies. And that's when Greg and Tim did that. And I think that that was the beginning of them realizing their own power together, which is great. But the re- reality was, I wasn't jealous of that. I wanted them to have their own friendship and their own reality too. I just, um, I think that there was some there was some heat around that too. But I don't know. I mean, it's it's all conjecture because I really have no idea what the fuck anyone truly feels. Well, I, I think that um, you know, as, as pointed out in the chat, uh, there was a uh, reference to a, a tweet that was put out by uh, I believe it was Tim and Andy, who said like, if if you vote, you know, a certain way, we really don't want you watching our stuff, right? And that that to me doesn't scream inclusive. It doesn't scream best community ever, you know. And I think it that's, just it, it's also weird because they don't know anything about that stuff. I know them. I mean, unless unless something ra- has radically changed they're completely ignorant on politics. So that, that makes it even stupider, but I agree. Like I want to be, um, I want to, I want to be inclusive because it's smart business, but it's also because of who I am, you know, I, and maybe it's the difference between growing up in a place like San Francisco and growing up in a place like Long Island, which is really moderately conservative, kind of, kind of moderate Trump country. And, um, I want to get along with people. I don't want to isolate or alienate myself, but people based on who they vote for, for president or what their politics are. I don't care. I really don't care. Unless you're like a communist or something or like a fascist. Right. But I really think that those we have, what, 335 million people in the United States. I mm-hmm. would honest to God say that there are probably literally the type of people we're really talking about that are like the vile people, maybe a couple hundred thousand, like at the most. So like it's I just want to get along with people. I don't care. I don't want to. I, I, and I want to know people. And it, it just doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense to me. You know, well, no, I, I mean, you're I 100 percent agree with you. Right. And. It's what's amazing is, you know, once again, the, the similarities between I, I feel like I'm talking to myself in this conversation at certain points because there are so many things. The idea of being shunned, I, you know, literally zero people from my screw attack days uh, want to be associated with me, uh, not based off anything that I've said. It's things that I haven't said. Right. It's it's I haven't, you know, put a put a black fist in my avatar on on. Uh, you know, on Twitter or, you know, th- things like that. Right. Uh, I haven't, you know, put it, put the right hashtag. I don't have Twitter. I don't have uh, pronouns in my bio. Right. And my thought process is very simple. Like you just do you and I'll do me. And as long as you don't tell me how I should live, then all is good. Right. And I won't tell you how you should live. You know, it's really it, simple. Right. The most basic shit. And also you and I are lucky enough to live in places where there's zero. I mean, I, I, I talked about this on a recent podcast where like the tent cities and all that. I live in central Virginia and uh, it's like you would put a tent up on the side of the road and it would be there about three and a half seconds mm-hmm. before like they they like there's just no tolerance for bullshit. And 
that's its own thing. But treating people with care and respect, having a multipolar world where you can have all sorts of ideas, even fuse those ideas into better ideas. I mean, God forbid. Um, but people, if people blows people's minds. My, my audience is totally immune to this. But some people that were listening to something I was on recently, it came up where it's like, would you vote for Biden or Trump? And I'm like, I'd vote for neither of them. If I had to vote for one or the other, I'd vote for Trump. But I don't but I don't have to vote for either. Then I'm not going to. I didn't vote last time in 2020. And that surprised some people. And I'm like, too bad, I guess, you know, like open your minds a little bit. Um, but I think also you and I come from a position where we don't have to play a game anymore. And I, I, I'm i always appreciative of my audience for that. Like the the level of success that Last Stand has afforded me is well beyond what I ever expected. And it means that I truly can say and do whatever I want, because not only does the audience, the growing audience want that, but there's no canceling me because I have no connections to, I I, I have no access. As you said, I, my PAX panel was canceled. Um, none of the publishers want to work with us anyway. No, no one wants to be our friends anyway. So we've just, we've managed to do it on our own. And I'm proud of that. Do you think that's because of, obviously, you know, there's this, this, uh, I say obviously, and I, I hesitate that because, you know, if you were to, in the industry, it's it's as big as it seems. It's still a very small industry, right? There's mm -hmm. everybody knows everybody in the industry. The PR person here worked for this company seven years ago, and they know everybody over there. And blah 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 blah, right? Um, and uh, people are so quick to throw out these terms, you know, racist, you know, whatever, you know, whatever. And um, do you think the idea that they don't want to work with you because they don't want to be attached to that, even though if, what whether it's true or not? Yeah, you know, first of all, don't tell my my black fiance that I'm. I know, I know, I know. Um, but it's, uh, it's like we've been called we've been called homophobic. Our you know my producer's gay, right? Like, and the people who like the people who who uh, who say these things, it's like when was the last time they had a, a black person or a Hispanic person or a gay person on their show? No, it's just like white dudes and white girls who are complaining about things, you know. So, well, uh, I'll say this: like I, I said once, Danny O'Dwyer, who I truly think is one of the stupidest people in the games industry. Once uh, on Twitter, we had an argument where I was saying, do you think that the person do you think diversity would be the black person that grew up next to me on Long Island or the white person from Ireland coming and living in America? And he was like, and, and in other words, to say, like, you are the outsider compared to the white and black person that lived in the United States that it's not, you know, skin deep or whatever. And he had a complete meltdown about those those very things. It's um, it's it's hysterical to me that these people are so rigid and yet also so backwards. A lot of the things they believe are misogynist. A lot of the things they believe are racist. A lot of the things that it's like, it's insanity. And um, so you said it, there's a small community of people in the industry. Their power is waning, right? Like they hold, I just, I won't even say any names in the PR people. I don't want to bring them heat, but Right. It's like they hold their their access codes over you like it matters, right? You know? Or they they'll they, they're like I don't want access to your fucking games. I don't care. You have no power over me. And when your audience affords that and understands why you're circumventing that, I think that it becomes less relevant what your politics are and more relevant what your intent is, which is to just make great content for your audience. And it makes them look stupid. It makes them look political. Um, and so I I just to me I I look at it and I think who cares like. Why, why is this even coming up? Why does it matter what I believe if we're talking about video games and podcasting and doing all these things? I think a lot of it comes from a fact, the fact that a lot of these people don't really like video games, don't want to be in the video game industry and are trying to create for themselves a political brand of journalism that they actually are chasing. And this is kind of where they're stuck. What are your, uh, Man, this is brought up in the chat, <laughs> and I just want to. Yeah, this is. I was like, oh shit, yeah. You know, we talk about people in the industry who have just been broken, right? And uh, Adam Sessler is one who who is brought up. Oh, you have issues with him? I, I yeah, he, he hates Adam Sessler. Hates me, um, which is funny because the last time I saw Adam Sessler, it was at an event for a Deep Silver for Homefront: The Revolution. So this was probably in 2015 or 2016. Gave me a big hug. Had all sorts of nice things to say to me, but the set the second everything go actually he came into my session to say hello to me. I remember that so well. And uh but that's, after everything that's went the down, most amazing thing. I'm sorry to cut it. That's the most yeah. amazing thing about it is that these like uh, so many people, so many people 
um, the last time I spoke to them, they're like, Hey, it's great to see you hugs all around, you know, blah, you know, whatever, let's go to dinner. Let's hang out. We do that. And then the next time you hear from the guys, a, you know, he's, he's a fascist. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a, he's a white supremacist racist. And it's like, what you just gave me a hug two years ago. Like what, what, what has changed between now and then? And, uh, it, My it's just, it's, it's amazing. My favorite arc with Adam Sessler is that he pretended that he made fuck you money on this small investment that he had with this company that got sold to Reddit. And I'm like, you can continue to believe that, that, that fiction as much as you want, Adam, like you would love to still be taken seriously in games. It's just that you're not. And that again is your own fault. He melted down completely. Um, oh, and yeah, I don't know. It's sad to see like social media. This is why I stopped posting except for promotionally on social media, because mm -hmm. I look back sometimes. I mean, this is one of the many reasons is that, kind of sound fucking crazy sometimes like everyone does you know it's better to just not share these thoughts at all and so i just i just don't i just let i just live the schadenfreude life and just let everyone else have their problems but i don't understand why he would want to so voluntarily crater his life or his career is not his life his career to the point where he just pretends that he doesn't like games never liked them was taking advantage of people and right. putting on a show and all of that. And I'm like, I don't think so, Adam, but I don't know why you are pretending that that is the case. Like you're above it all now. <laughs> um, and really kind of getting hook, line and sinker into like the whole gamers are bad. And I don't know. He he's a, he's a chucklehead. That guy's weird, man. <laughs> I never, <laughs> never, uh, never heard anybody described as a chucklehead, but I love it. <laughs> I love it. Love it. Um, okay, so here's the, here's the big question, yeah. right? We are, like I said, what's the mo what's most fascinating thing about this is the last six, seven years, people have been broken, right? Whether it was the election, whether it was COVID, whether it was whatever, right? People have been broken the last few years, and we have another election cycle coming up. People who have never been political have become political. People who don't know shit about politics, all of a sudden want to be, you know, want to tell you all their po political leanings, right? What happens in 2024 if Trump wins? Mm -hmm. What happens to the game industry? What happens to, like, do people just dig in further? Or, like, wh what's what's the, I don't know, give me a crystal ball. I don't think it's going to be good. I don't think it's going to be good at all. Um, you have to think about, like, if Trump ran, if Trump won... God, man, I don't even know how things are going to go because you kind of feel this energy that the Democrats are trying to slowly show Biden the door, get mm -hmm. someone in at the last minute, like maybe a Gavin Newsom. I think they realize that Kamala Harris is not going to happen. So um, so I think it's going to depend a lot about who he runs against as well. And I also think it, it's going to matter if Trump keeps getting indicted. It doesn't seem like it matters. It actually seems like it helps him. I keep talking about the possibility of a really big suicide vest third party candidate that literally is just designed to blow the shit up and you know a little bit like like ross perot with a little bit of panache maybe getting to 25 points instead of 20 starting to win some states and all of that but um rfk i like rfk i just think that he's too marginalized like it's too, the marginalization of him has been too successful and the media is so the mainstream media like is so in the tank for biden for some reason the walking vegetable in a suit um that they will do anything to protect him including from a a viable candidate, I think, in RFK, but RFK is a third party, I think would be interesting, but um, yeah, I don't know. But I, I think if Trump won, I think that we actually have to look at the reality that the gaming industry fracturing is going to be the least of our problems, because I think the meltdowns are going to be um, not good and probably civil unrest and doing all that stuff. I'm not saying it's right or not, because the election is the election, but I really visualize a reality where it's neither of them, but I don't know we're running out of time um, and I don't know how that's going to work out. So we'll see. I, I just, I couldn't in good conscience vote for Biden because I really don't think he's all there. And I, I earnestly mean that I, I think it's obvious. And, uh, but I wouldn't vote for if in a, in a true open field, I wouldn't vote for Trump either out of principle because I don't think he's really fit for the office. So I would probably either just not vote again or hopefully, like I said, there'll be a, a third party candidate wearing a suicide vest willing to blow this shit up. Do you know anything about the election of 1876? Are you a history guy by chance? Uh, I don't know anything about the election of 1876, but I'm ready to learn. That was uh, Rutherford B. Hayes beat, beat Tilden and Tilden actually won the, the popular vote. And there was like some consternation about 
who was going to become president based on the the fracturing of the electoral votes. And um, they had the compromise of 1876, which ended reconstruction and all that. But the House of Representatives really ended up choosing Rutherford B. Hayes as the president. And I think our best hope is to replicate that, to get to a position where no one gets 270 electoral votes. And so constitutionally, the House of Representatives has to pick a candidate and the House would hopefully pick because they can pick anyone at, at that point. You don't, you're not constrained to who ran or who you can pick anyone you want as long as they're constitutionally eligible. And maybe that would be the hope to get someone, you know, sane in there, like some sort of like angel on the clouds coming down to save the Republic. But, you know, short of that, I think we're actually in a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, I mean, you know, you obviously you're, you're a history buff. You know a lot about politics. You ever thought about running? Um, yeah, I think, I think about running for the house sometimes, but, um, I, I think I would need to give it more time because I come off as a carpetbagger, especially in the South, um, doing that. And um, I don't think I really, first of all, I, I don't think I would be successful because I don't think I would do what would be necessary to be successful. Um, and which is like play party games and, and, you know, hobnob and raise money. I mean, it's fun. people make fun of Ron DeSantis because he doesn't like to hobnob and raise money. And I'm like, I don't fucking want to, I wouldn't want to do that shit either, but that's the, unfortunately the game you have to play. So, I don't think I have the mechanics to become a candidate in the United States for office, but I think about it sometimes. I just, I don't think that that's the best use of my abilities personally. I think the best use of my abilities is to just speak into a microphone and, um, and talk. So that's what I do. <laughs> nice. Well, so you, you've obviously been doing that for, uh, you know, for, for a while, for a long time, literally your entire career has been built around speaking into a microphone, right? Indeed. And you you left uh you left kind of funny you saw you've seen tremendous success as as people have pointed out you've you've won you've won in the divorce right uh you have last end media and it obviously blew up and it's allowed you to go from uh you know uh, a podcast and now what is four uh, uh, is it four podcasts you have yeah god i don't even know it's like yeah sacred symbols defining duke punching up is our new one for nintendo mm -hmm. and then we have knockback and constellation so i guess that would be five plus five. The supplements for both Duke and and uh, Sacred, so technically seven, I guess. But um, yeah, we're we're that's the maximum amount of content we we wanted to ultimately get to one piece of content a day, and uh, I think we're pretty much there. So yeah, so very so walk me through this. You leave the page, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the Patreon blows up, and you're like, holy shit, what do I do? Right, and I'm sure that was your thought process. Like, holy yeah, shit. I actually wanted, I actually investigated. It's so funny because like it's so it's like what the hell were you thinking? But at the time, it was growing so much. I wanted to almost see if it could be frozen. Like I, I reached out to Patreon. I was like, "Can you just freeze it? Like this is so much pressure. I like give me a little bit of time." But it all worked. It all yeah. We, I ended up getting to like five thousand. The first time I did Rogan, I think Joe Rogan show. I, I think I had five thousand um, people, and he was talking about how amazing that was. And now we're up to thirteen thousand one hundred paying subscribers. So um, every month, which is awesome. So it's grown much beyond my expectations. What I said on Rogan at the time was I would love to make $10,000 a month, like the business to just live and be. And it's, it's exceeded that so many times. It's amazing. So, um, so it's, it's, it was scary at first because I wanted to leave and do political content. I'm really glad I got that out of my system because now mm -hmm. I know I have certain, I don't want to change anything in life, but I think you'll, you'll agree that there are certain kind of branches in life and I didn't take one path and I'm curious what would have happened. So, one of them is that like I, I left grad school and never, you know, never finished my history education and I wanted to be a professor and all of that. And I've always been curious what would have happened, although I'll never revisit that path. But I was actually able to kind of revisit it by trying to be a political commentator. And um, I just found it to be kind of horrifying, to be honest. It was uh, not what I expected. I people I, one day I'll, t I'll say who it was, but I got a job offer almost immediately from a major political outlet um, for like three hundred thousand dollars a year to go do shit for them and i'm like i just don't want to do partisan politics like i just and that was even before i started like really launched cls and all of that so it was like in the week afterwards where they were like really trying to get me and i was like this is really interesting and quite awesome but i just don't want to do this and um and so i tried to do the political content for about six months and i found it unhappy mostly because i found and you probably noticed this is that there's not though most people occupy the middle space. Those aren't the people that speak about politics or watch oh, yeah. polit political content or even care. Mm -hmm. So you have to kind of choose your hive. And if you don't, you really just get it from every side. And I just found it to be a very disenchanting experience. So I kind of just was like, I don't want to do this anymore after six months or so. And I went back into games 
and I'm glad that I got that out of my system because I really think I would still be very curious about what how that would have went. But um, but I found out and it just wasn't it just wasn't for me. And uh, I don't miss it at all, to be honest. So, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's obviously turned out great. I, I think from a business perspective, one of the things that I really am fascinated with is your conversion and your audience right when you look at the last stand media you know previously collins last stand uh youtube channel right when you go in here and you see you have eighty six thousand subscribers but when you go to your patreon and you see you have you know uh 15 this is fifteen thousand members right yeah we're That's a um it, it's worth noting we're in a we're always in betas on patreon they always experiment on our patreon and mm -hmm. see what so, so we have free members right now that are counted in that number so it would be dis disingenuous to pretend that it's fifteen thousand paying members it's thirteen thousand one hundred right now well yeah. that's still a ridiculous conversion of your audience over like what do you think contributes to that that relationship that the audience has um and have you continued to see growth on because Podcasts on YouTube, especially long form podcasts, traditionally you grow through clips on YouTube, mm -hmm. smaller clips. And, and you guys, you know, you obviously produce a, a lot of long form content. Uh, and as you know, just a quick glance through your uh, the the uh, the channel itself on YouTube, you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, smaller clips that you guys have. No, no, everything's like hours long. Right, right, right. Um, so, we so actually I'll experimented with the clips channel, but it's just not doing very well. So right. So, so how does it, so a couple things here, how does the long form relate to growth on YouTube? And then how do you funnel that to the support on Patreon? Yeah, it's a good question. I think, um, I think there's a place for all uh, there. There's a place for content that's 20 minutes long. And there's a place for content that's like sacred symbols, four hours or more long. And I've always been a fan of the longer content. When I go and see a, uh, I love Lex Friedman. I used to love Sam Harris, although I don't really listen to him anymore, or Rogan or someone. And I see that they talk to someone for 90 minutes. I'm like, Ugh, I almost don't want to listen to it because I feel like you're almost just getting going. Mm -hmm. And and I'm talking not in like general interview like this, but like deep dives into an academic subject or into a, you know, something. And you want to like really get going into it. So I've really fed into that and feel like there's not that that space in games isn't really being taken up mostly because I think gaming content's quick and people's attention spans are short and we're kind of leveraging a different audience. Um, in fact, on YouTube, we ask people to unsubscribe from our YouTube channel if they're really not watching our videos because we want like a, the most accurate. We don't think that that number really matters. We want the most accurate ratio to see like what is actually working to be able to work the numbers the most. Um, and our watch time is huge. Like apps, like our, our average watch time on a video is like 45 minutes or something, which is nuts on you. People that are on YouTube know that now when right. you put up four, four hour products, people are like, okay, so 45 minute average watch time. I'm like, yeah, we give you timestamps. You jump around. A lot of people listen to the whole damn thing. And we see that too. And then we translate it because, and I, I always make fun of people that do this, the and I don't know if you do this. So I don't mean to make fun of you, but it's like not feeling well today. Can't stream. See you guys next time. No, don't you know? do that. Never, Consistent. never. Got to be consistent. Exactly. That's exactly right. If you are not consistent, don't even bother. Mm -hmm. And I think that that I'll eat your lunch if you're not consistent. I'm, I'll gladly eat your lunch if you're not consistent. So that I think draws people to the Patreon. We don't miss. We we publish every day, whether it's Christmas or whether it's New Year's or whatever. There's a new episode of Sacred Symbols on every you know Friday. There's a new episode of Sacred Symbols Plus Wednesdays and Saturdays, no matter what. Uh, when we take vacations at the end of the year, we try to go away for like most of December and early in January, but we still have everything lined up. So everything publishes. That's when we do all of our Game of the Year stuff and our longer conversations about this, that, and the other thing. So I think consistency draws people to us because they can't. What's re, what's so strange is that people have no discipline in the content creation space realizing that you're very product it would be like tuning in in 1996 to nbc at nine o'clock on thursday night it's like ah seinfeld's not on this today we, we right we didn't really feel like putting it out it's like what are you talking about you can't do that to your cu customer so i think it, of course it's quality and it's humor and it's all the other things that i think we do well but i think that a lot of it comes down to consistency and i just love i every day i see those tweets from from people when i'm on twitter where oh sorry guys couldn't make it something came up it's like okay maybe go get a real job somewhere else. Cause I don't think you're cut out for this. Do, do uh, with, with last stand you've mentioned, you have not necessarily been embraced by the industry. Uh, oh, no, no. It, have, uh, 
have people not come on the show, your show, mainly because of uh, because of that, or because because of your the perception attached to uh, your shows? Definitely, because I'm 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 personal friends with a lot of people that work in the games industry on games, like especially in the Sony ecosystem, that I could definitely have on, except for the fact that they would have to go through PR and it would get shut down. Like Sony PR is is an iron gate, you know, um, as I'm sure you know. So it's uh so like while I'm personally friendly with Neil or other guys, James Stevenson, or other guys, Marcus Smith at Insomniac. And we would have awesome conversations on the show. I know that that's not possible. And in fact, we tried to circumvent that. Uh, Neil gave me uh, his HBO like contact, and we tried to get him on through that. And still, Sony obviously shut that down as well. But then there are others that are either above the fray or simply do whatever they want. And I must admit, I've told Neil in the past, I'm like, Neil, they're not going to fire you, so just come on the show like <laughs> like I, I guarantee you, you're not gonna get in trouble like you're neil Druckmann. um but nonetheless i appreciate that he wants to play by the rules but then there are guys like i'm i'm friends with ken levine and i had him on the show a couple months ago and he just doesn't ask for permission he just does whatever he wants mm -hmm. um and so you have but i think an important thing is is that while we have industry guests on sometimes i don't really want to do that because generally speaking because most of it's marketing and I don't want to get caught in the marketing cycle when, you know, director goes to all these different shows to pimp his game. I either want to have like a Ken Levine type conversation where we were talking about all we didn't talk about Judas or Bioshock really at all. We talked about all sorts of random shit. That's what I wanted to do with Neil, too. I wanted to talk to Neil about writing. I don't want to talk about the games. Um, but I think that the audience likes that we don't we're outside like we're after I do this uh, in like an hour. I have to record the Final Fantasy 16 spoiler cast and review discussion with our with our people. We have we all played it at the same time as our audience because we didn't get it early. And I think the audience kind of digs that. Mm -hmm. Like, I think the bespoke nature of old media is kind of a put off to a lot of people. Oh, I and dude, I used to be the same way. I got this game early. I'm so excited. Look at me playing this on PSN. Right. My trophies are live. I remember feeling that. But over time, it kind of loses its luster. I think by the time the PS4 came out, I'm like, I don't really give a shit about this anymore. And now I'm I, now I'm so great. I feel so happy to not have the pressure of embargoes and relationships. And I never held anything back in a review, but you know that that stuff affects relationships. If you give a game a bad review, it's going to affect your relationship with those people. And so I just I'm glad that I don't have to deal with that anymore. And again, that comes from an audience that I think just wants something different. The micro community, the precious micro community, which is uh, allowed us to do this. I love the idea of talking about whatever the hell you want to talk about. Like, you know, I think having you on, I think it'd be a disservice to the audience to not have the conversations we've had so far. But like, yes, I would love to eventually just have you on and talk. Honestly, football. I would love to talk sports with you. That's I one would, of my very favorite things in the world is football. So I would like, do you guys have a sports show? No, we don't. I, I don't. Don't you find that there's not a, like the whole sports ball thing? You know, I, I, like, it drives me fucking insane. But man. don't you, but I, I, this is what I would, Chris and I had this conversation where I was trying to tell him, like, shouldn't football fans like turn based role playing games? <laughs> right? Like, aren't they the right. same thing? Right. Like, it, like, you're taking turns, you're making moves, you're making decisions, you're on the clock. All, I just feel like there's some, it's not everyone, but there's a lot, there's a big division between game content consumers and sports fans. And I'm surprised that the Venn diagram is in a circle, but the Venn diagram barely touches in some no. ways. And so that's why I'm just, I just, and also I want to keep sports to myself. I've, I've thoroughly ruined video games, right? So it would be nice to like have the Islanders and the Jets and all that kind of stuff just for myself. And, uh, but we talk about it sometimes on our Q and A and, and all of that. Do you play sports games or anything like that? Cause I've also tried to stay away from those to try to, keep them separate <laughs> i like arcade sports games oh at jam nice yeah absolutely man mm -hmm. that that's that's that is pardon pardon the pun that is my jam and there's uh, that new did you see that legends bowl coming out that game legends bowl that's coming uh, out is, next month is, is it this is it the football game yeah it's like the tecmo style um football uh, game. It looks, no it looks, it looks awesome and the, uh the one that i saw out, oh go ahead i'm sorry i'm sorry i was, I was just saying i think it comes out in august you might want might if you're into like the more arcade style old school you know blades of steel that kind of shit yeah 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 um, yeah, yeah, mean, this I, is the, I, yeah this is it okay yeah I, there was one that was uh built to be kind of like uh nfl blitz um but which which i love blitz blitz is, yeah, like, blitz is awesome yeah you know, amazing the the problem with it was that they were it's it's marquee quarterback was a guy who hasn't played in the league in seven years colin kaepernick yeah it's, it's like well that's that's the uh <laughs> 
It's like, what, why? Like the dude hasn't played, right? Yeah, so it's why, the license what? you can get, you know? Right, um, right. Because you probably, they're probably, you know, that's a good question, but there's probably something to do with the NFLPA too, where you're not allowed to do some sort of external non-NFL license or something for a game. There's all sorts of weird verboten rules about about the way these guys interact. But I um, I think we're going to see, a, there slowly is this bubbling comeback of of smaller sports games, not only indie style and arcade games, but I think we need better management and simulation games too. Um, do you remember the game NFL Head Coach? Yes. Yeah, I loved that game. I loved Did you? It. I loved it. I just loved it. I just, I was like, this is so great. Um, and uh, they eventually built that into Madden, but I would love to see more stuff like that. I think they did a sequel, but that was the end of it. I think late. Yeah, if I recall, I, I think there's a uh, a soccer version of that coming out where there's a, like a soccer manager. Yeah, soccer management and F1 management are big games, I think, on PC. And I think the interface would just be better for PC. But um, yeah, I just, I love, I love simulation. I love sports, man. I, I love, I love everything about it, you know? Um, and it frustrates me that more game gamers aren't more sports fans because um, I, just... I think they're I think they're closet fans, right? Like it's one of those things where there's this like you hear the sports bull and it's like it's not cool. You're either a gamer or you're a sports guy, and it's so stupid. It's like there's there is tremendous crossover. There people play games and they play and they play sports. They like watching sports, but the the turn based RPG side, like that's actually a really interesting analogy of. Um, of, of football. baseball and football are turn-based games yeah you know um that i think would be if you just look at it like that but I, i've always been both you probably can't see it in my shop but i have my varsity letter from high school on on the shelf the b right there Let's go. so i was i was both you know you, and i've always been i've always been both um what, what was your sport hockey yeah uh, yeah wow so, awesome um, did you so, were, like obviously you say you're an islanders fan right yep uh let's let's do let's do a quick quick sports talk real quick sure okay okay all right so uh the i i thought the golden knights this year were just so far ahead of everybody i thought i thought florida got hot going into the playoffs they rode their hot goalie the worst thing that happened to them was they took a week off and their goalie cooled off and then all of a sudden they got steamrolled in the in this in the finals there's something about hot goaltending that's and i was a goalie um there is something about like hot goaltending, that's a, that's real. It's so interesting, especially in the playoffs. You just get in a mode. I was sad. About, I mean, I um, I thought the Panthers were a feel good story, but my fiance is a huge Bruins fan, so I was I was sad for her. Um, the Islanders obviously, um, probably really shouldn't have been there at all. But the bigger thing that annoys me about the success and variables of the Kraken and obviously much more of the Golden Knights is just how. And you'll, I think, appreciate this. Like, you used to have to earn your, you like, expansion teams in the NHL used to be fucking horrible. Yeah. Like, yeah. I remember when the Senators came in. I think they won something like eight games that first year. Like, you're supposed to be bad. And I think that the the expansion draft rules were just too good. And they, like, the fact that the Golden Knights immediately got, like, a Stanley Cup winning goaltender, all these different things. Like, it's not right. supposed to work like that. And so I know that they had to keep the rules the same for Vegas and Seattle because people were complaining about Vegas. And the NHL was saying, we have agreed to keep the rules the same. But hopefully, if they expand again, they will narrow that down again. Because I think it was kind of lame to see these teams immediately in the playoffs, immediately in the cup, immediately. With, it's like, what? That's so dumb. That's so dumb and should be insulting to all NHL fans. Agreed. Um, so that and all the teams. Was, yeah. 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 Well, so uh, so going into let's let's just do a quick run through of every single sport that's happening sure. right now. All right, sure. so uh, baseball's happening. Who do you have? Who's going to win I'm the a, uh, World Series? Oh, I I don't. I'm a kind of a uh, a lapsed Yankees fan to be honest with you. I don't pay. I I pay enough attention to know, but um, I don't know. Like I, the one thing that's fascinating to me actually recently that I read is a Buster Olney piece about the trade market for. Shohei Otani. Mm -hmm. Have you read this at all? What do you think it would require to get him? Because my brother and I were talking about this and I was like, it, mm, you can't trade draft picks, I don't think, in the MLB, so that's not an option. So it has to be money and players. Right. And you could do cash, but none of the teams are cash drafts. So, because you would imagine he would, you could probably sell him Babe Ruth style for like a billion dollars or something. But I don't think that anyone cares about that. Do you well, think it would work? Do you think it would require like a package of like literally twenty five players from your farm system and some and some other things to get him? Right. Well, uh, the selling aspect of things, yeah, I don't think nobody's interested in that at least for for half a season because that's what they're doing. It would need to come with a. It would need to be a 
you know, a trade and sign type of thing. Right. That's know? exactly right. It would be the assumption that he would want to sign a contract. So, right. Right. Yeah. And where's he going to go? Like what teams can realistically afford him? He's not going to go to Pittsburgh, right? He's probably not going to go to Texas, right? Uh, and because the Angels don't want to trade him to their division. So that puts him in realist in there. He's not going to go to Seattle, right? Seattle would be actually phenomenal because, you know, there's a, a big Japanese uh, market up there. Uh, so you're looking at the coastal cities of, of New York. You're looking at Boston, um, maybe Toronto, maybe. But you're, like you're looking far away uh, or somewhere somewhere in the National League, right? So uh to go back to your question, of, it's so funny, by the way, that that's even an option for him, right? Because I, I said that to my brother. I'm like, he can't go to the NL because they don't have the DH, and he's like, that's oh. not a that's not a thing anymore, you know? Yeah, like, it, yeah. anymore. 100%. And I'm like, oh, oh, you know, like, I, but when I see Houston, I still think that they're an NL team. So I agree. I listen. They, they play in the division the Rangers play in, <laughs> and I still think of them as. And same <laughs> with the Brewers. I think the Brewers are an AL team, but uh, they, they've been in the National League for 20, 30 years now. Um, yeah, you know, but to go back to your question, if it who they have to give up, yeah, it'd be it'd be ten players in the minor leagues. It'd be uh, you know, uh, probably five five single A players with potential hopes that are your top picks or whatever, you know. And yeah, you're looking at probably legitimately ten to twelve players plus somebody in the in the major leagues uh, that has a really really good contract yeah place. he it was interesting because only was writing about it from the perspective of like it is obvious that you trade him like there is no question that you trade him and i was like that's so interesting why mm -hmm. why and I, I guess his whole thing is like you build a team with all the assets here. like the, the angels the angels kind of suck i mean yeah. imagine how how bad they would be without him you know um so what's yeah. that say more about their their franchise that they've had mike trout and shohei otani the last few years together in their prime and they can't do shit. Yeah, it's, you know, he's just, he's really brought me, not bought back to baseball. So I, I stopped watching baseball. I was actually uh, uh, obsessive about baseball for many, many years into my probably mid twenties, but I kind of got tired of the, the watching the NFL and the NHL so closely. It's like, these leagues are just much better because there's just so much more parity in them. And they got to get the salary cap under control in the MLB. I saw um someone got signed for like today for like you know um or not today it was in basketball actually for mm -hmm. like this absurd amount of money for like 300 million dollars whatever max yeah. contract and i'm like where's all this money coming from for all these sports like what the fuck is going on here that's so much money that is an insane amount of money to do this so i think the mlb is like the the most indicative of the the sport that feels like a pyramid scheme where i watch a game i'll tune it in every once in a while and like watch whatever's on and it's like most of the stadium's empty mm -hmm. you look at the ratings and you're like the ratings are down and the guys just keep getting paid all this money. I'm like, I guess it works somehow. But to me, it just it became less exciting. I also needed time off from sports. You know, like uh, I'm really, really into football and really, really into hockey. So that really dominates, especially football, just dominates my life. And this year it's going to be awesome, I think. But um, you're jet Jets, right? I yeah, mean, Jets fan. Yeah, come on, um, you got you got Rogers. That's a dude. I am through them my uh nephew declan who's gonna be a senior in high school he gives me credit for this because he's like you spoke this into into reality he's like during and i didn't remember this i was I, I apparently during the playoffs i was at his house for one of the games and he's i was talking about how the jets should get aaron Rodgers and all this stuff and then he slowly started reading about it and it started happening i was like wow i really did wish this into existence but i actually my rogers jersey should come today i or i just ordered one and um man am i amped i can't wait i'm wait but we i was joking around with my fiance they're gonna be on hard knocks this year and i'm like i can't wait to watch week three hard knocks when rogers tears his acl <laughs> right 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 well he's saying all the right things right now about how this this it wouldn't would be it wouldn't be a service to the jets if i only played one season and yeah i'm sure as a jets fan that gets you you know gets your boner going pretty good dude i'm, I'm uh, amped up about that. i'm also amped because it seemed obvious that he was going to play more than one season based on what we gave up for him i think that that would have been a real dick move for him to play one year or at least intend to play one year with us giving up two picks like that you know two prime picks so back back to rogers though man and now he's your quarterback man um i can't believe it it. Yeah. it was it was amazing to see how he was vilified this past season this is a two-time mvp who's who is uh you know, who was just like, hey, I think people should <laughs> be careful about what they put in their bodies. And like, and people in the in the media was just like, no, it'll be interesting to see how how that stacks up in New York of all places. Yeah, I um, I think he'll be fine. And I think that he's he's in the 
he has a unique combination of money and talent that's still current MVP level talent, probably, or at least maybe waning MVP talent where it's like, I don't give a shit what you think, you know, and I was I was making my fiance laugh because I was saying like I was reading about him lately where he apparently only eats protein now. Like, I don't know if you've seen pictures of him. He's lost a ton of weight. And I'm like, wow, man, this he's really on this Tom Brady quest for redemption. I And he has a mega chip on his shoulder. I just can't. I can't wait. The only bummer is that our schedule is so rough. It's very, very rough. But who are you playing this year? Uh, well, we have the Bills twice, obviously, which is fine. But we play the we play the AFC West, um, and uh, so we have the Chiefs, and we have all these other. The first, uh, I'll actually pull this up for you. I mean, so I don't, I don't want to misspeak. Uh, Jets NFL schedule. The first, first um six games are rough, 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 rough. Yeah. So here it is. It'll be Bills. And then at Cowboys, Patriots, Chiefs, Broncos, Eagles, bye. Man, I'll so, tell you what, you're right. Rodgers, he looks skinny. Yeah, he he apparently has shed weight for mobility, which I think will be good. But I think our offensive line is pretty good, too, so I think he'll be okay. But I'm, yeah, I mean, I can't, him to to Garrett Wilson, I, I, I just, he keeps saying Garrett, maybe, maybe he's gassing him up, but he keeps saying Garrett Wilson has that, that Devontae Adams energy. And I'm like, if that's true, and he obviously was the rookie offensive rookie of the year. If that's true, then you know, maybe I. This is the thing. Who who are you a fan of? You're in Dallas, right? Are you a Cowboys fan? So people always say this. They go say, who, you know, you're in Dallas. You got to be a Cowboys fan. I I don't really have a team, but I say that I I just like watching football. Um, but when the Cowboys win, Dallas is a better city. Hmm. So I hope the Cowboys win. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I like my uncle is a huge Cowboys fan, and I like the the Cowboys. I think that they're they're fun to watch and always interesting. Jerry Jones is an interesting, um, interesting character. But um, I do wonder. I ask you that just because one of the conversations in Jets fandom right now is like, well, we don't know how to win. We have no idea how to win. And I'm not saying even the Super Bowl. Like we don't know how to win anything. So we're we haven't made the playoffs since 2010, even. So we are very used to losing and it's almost comical. What happened last year was comical where we were six and three and seven and four and all this. And then we just wash out. And uh, so we're all waiting for the bad thing to happen. And uh, we all don't know how to feel right now. And it's because this is the best jets team on paper ever. I mean, I think a lot of people are saying like the, like ever. And that's interesting. (laughs) I'll say this. I think that winning starts from the top. Right. And I, I don't think it starts with the general manager or the president. I think it starts with your quarterback. And I think that if you have a winning quarterback that has one, uh, that that will trickle down to everybody else in the organization. Right. And now there are instances you talk about the Cowboys. They haven't done anything in literally a quarter century. Mm-hmm. Right. They, they've been a very mediocre franchise for a long time with overhyped expectations. Um, now, I do think that starts from the top. And you've seen the Cowboys over the last few years. They've seen they've had success. But it's because they've pulled back on on Jerry Jones. Apparently, that's that's all the that's that's been the uh, common story here is that Jones has uh, transferred his power, or they pulled back from his power that he had from being a general manager, and now that's uh, passed on to other people who are making those decisions, which is why they've seen success in drafting and and uh, and free agency and and uh, developing players. So. Um, but yeah, I, I think the Jets will be be just fine. But yeah, I think get through that first first few games, and, and there'll be obviously be hurdles. You know, uh, Rogers probably won't play any any free any uh, preseason games, and he'll go in and treat his first game like it's his first. You know, and he, he may throw a pick or two because a guy runs runs the wrong route or whatever it may be. But just don't panic. You know, it'll be great. It'll be great. And we all know that in a few years he'll play for uh, the Vikings, anyways, just like Brett Favre. Yeah, that would be that would be an interesting arc. Yeah, this feels so much better than the Favre situation. The Favre situation never felt right because he came in during training camp and it was like during his third retirement dalliance with the right. Packers and all this stuff. I, I I do think the way the Packers treated Rodgers, or at least the way he can see perceives that, is a huge advantage for the Jets. Um, and because he just, I know he wants to win again, and I know. Rodgers is an all-time great. Obviously, we all know that. He's some some people consider him the greatest quarterback ever, just raw quarterback ever. But he, I know it bothers him. He's only won once, and I hope that that helps sure. drive him to 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 win again. But um, I don't know. We'll see. It's I'm counting down the days. It's like so close. You know, they're in camp now, and everything's getting together. So, and Hard Knocks is going to make it even more heightened. And the last time the Jets were on Hard Knocks was the last time they made the playoffs. So hopefully that's a good. That was a Rex Ryan team, and so hopefully that's a um a good 
sign of things to come. But having a legitimate quarterback is so weird because the Jets teams in my life that have been good have all been good defense. Like when we went to the championship game in 2009 and 2010, both of those years, it was our defense because Sanchez was our quarterback at that time. Right. So. With, with the butt fumble. The butt, that was that was two, that that was Thanksgiving 2012. <laughs> and I'll never forget it. <laughs> no one will ever forget the greatness of the butt fumble. That I, that led like Sports Center with the top ten, not top ten. I think they had to retire it at some point. It was just, I mean, when you watch that, you see what was happening and you see why he ran into the guy's butt. But at the same time, it, <laughs> it's he was, just, he was, it's just funny, you know. It's outstanding. It's the perfect name too. Like butt fumble is just a great name. That he fumbled was part of it too. So yeah, right, right, right. Um, do, do you have a basketball team? Um, I passively root for the Nets, but I don't consider myself an NBA fan, um, really at all. I like basketball a lot, but I just, again, it's, it's on at the wrong time, you know? Oh, that's, that's, that I don't, I'm the kind of guy that like wonders why we're even doing, um, well, anyway, never mind. What were you, what were you going to say? Well, so I was going to, I was asking like, is it, is it the politics? Why, why you're not a big fan of the NBA? If you like basketball or no, it's just there. First of all, I think basketball as a game is really great. I, I love playing it. And it is fun to watch. Like playoff basketball is really fun to watch. But I feel like uh, my, uh, um, Micah was rolling her eyes at me when I was saying this. I'm like, I just feel like everyone's traveling all the time. Like when I'm watching that, when I'm watching, like everyone's walking like four or five steps. Like what is going on in the sport? And college basketball is c- called much tighter than that in my experience. But so I don't know what's going on with that, which really bothers me. And then um, so there's that the politics doesn't bother me, to be honest with you. And I'm, I'm I have American history tattoos on my arms. I'm a, I'm a patriot. But. I'm kind of the kind of guy that's like, why are we even saying the Pledge of Allegiance at these games? Can we just play a game? Like, why does everything have to have like some sort of to honor America? I'm like, dude, it's the Jets Patriots. Can we just play? It's one o'clock in the afternoon. Let's just play the game. You know, Um, so I I think all of that needs to be removed. All of it. Here's my theory on that. I think that at some point somebody wanted wanted to play it uh for whatever reason right there was something that happened and it's like hey we're gonna sing this and they want their uh, every event to sound to feel bigger than it actually is so you know with the super bowl you're gonna play it because it's a large event well naturally if the super bowl is gonna do it then we want to do it in the playoff games well if the playoff games are gonna do it then we're gonna do it in the regular season games right and if the regular season game is gonna do it we need to do it in the preseason games and uh and i think that was there was just a trickle down effect um it may have happened in you know the Super Bowl three or whatever, you know, and, and it happened and they, and then it just kind of became a tradition where I, I think that was the initial thought process. This is a big event. Cause you see that now in like, you see the national anthem played at like Rubik's cubes competitions, you know, people trying to solve, you know, it's like, we're going to play the national anthem before then. And I get the idea of the sense of camaraderie, the sense of pride in your nation. But yeah, there are times where I feel like it's, it's a little, little overdone as well. Well, keep it to the, like, that wouldn't it make the Olympics and the World Cup even more powerful if that was when like people went off, you right. know, and had like the um about uh you know just the create because I remember watching the World Cup, it was probably in two World Cups ago or three World Cups ago when the United States was in it. And I remember watching one of the games and it was awesome because they just the whole bowl of the arena was just like don't tread on me flags and mm-hmm. all the like American revolutionary flags and all the signage and stuff. I'm like, this is dope. You know, but this would be like totally out of place at an NFL game. And rightfully so. Like when I go to an Islanders game and they play the Flames, I'm sitting there for the fucking Canadian National Anthem. Like, what are we what right. are we doing? You know, so I'm I'm just always of the mind. Like, let's just get let's get going. You know, well, speaking of going, I know you have uh, another thing to shoot here. In about yeah, I minutes, probably so should I, I, actually I go. But it was, it wanna, was fun yeah. to talk to you. Yeah, for sure. I, I don't want to like, you know, uh, take you too much time, but uh, I'll read Super Chats in a minute. But thank you, man, for coming on. Like, it's. I love talking to you. I feel like uh, it's been a long time coming and uh, I'm legitimately proud of what you've been able to be, uh, what you've been able to do. And uh, um, you know, your, your ability to be who you are, I think is the biggest thing, you know, you've been Thank able you. to stay who you stay, who you are, as opposed to uh, bend to uh, the games industry, which is great. So congratulations on that. Thanks. Yeah. I'm like the most flawed individual in the world, but, but I try my hardest and I try to do good content. I'm not above, the fray in any way but i i just try to deliver and um i'm glad that it's like it's worked and it's uh it's gratifying people say i won and yeah i i, I did win i guess but i want to continue to win it's not a one-time thing like let's keep winning and uh so everyone's support is much appreciated and i hope that i'd love to come back on we can just talk about games next time i i um would love it i'm curious to know what, especially 
side scrollers i don't know if you guys you obviously have a special affinity for that and i do too so um and my studio makes only 2d side scrolling games so um oh, we gotta find a way to work together good lord that's amazing yeah so uh, we're working on our what is it our sixth game now so um spectacular so yeah spectacular. well uh everyone go over and subscribe obviously to uh last stand media over on youtube you can also support them over at uh patreon.com slash last stand media colin i appreciate you man like uh, what a stud and uh way to you know just continued success for you man I'm, I'm proud of you thank you likewise i appreciate you thank you for reaching out um have a great rest of your week do i just x out of this thing now is you just x out man and, and i'll, wow, I'll take so care easy. of that yeah isn't it great all right buddy, all right, take it all easy right my friend be well thanks again bye-bye all, right. all, right. all right there he goes uh awesome show uh i love chatting with with really smart people and um you know colin is he, mainly because i'm not smart so colin gets to lift us all up so i want to read off some of these super chats here uh in just a minute and uh and let, let's kind of go uh mark came in mark who once again was interviewed by colin uh very early on in the last stand media empire says uh the term for users like colin is red eye jedi <laughs> thank you mark appreciate that kyle came in says uh, is this the Colin that says beyond? He says beyond his PlayStation co's Greg Miller. I think, I think, shout out, bro. Uh, my childhood. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate that. Uh, Desiree, what came in, Desiree, great to see you. Said uh, tribalism within politics is alive and well, even if you don't don't uh, know really anything at all. Desiree, speak the truth. Desiree, great to see you. Looking forward to having you on very, very soon. Uh, Couch Entertainments says, Craig, put on the ribbon. If you know, you know. That's from Seinfeld back in the day. Put on the ribbon. Uh, Chris came in and says, my favorite, my, my sports game fandom died when NCAA football that did. Uh, I think I think they're bringing it back. Aren't they bringing it back? Um, so, yeah. Uh, dude came in over on Rumble with the $5 Rumble rant. Dude says, uh, Jaffe doesn't understand good game design. Called Metroid Dread a bad game just because he had to shoot shoot a wall to move forward. Uh, like all other Metroid games <laughs> and what was explained in the tutorial. Thank you, dude. Appreciate that. Uh, he also came back, came back and says, it's too bad uh, the Libertarian Party isn't treated fairly. We would be better off if it was given a chance by more people. We'd love to see Trump versus David uh, Trump versus David Smith debate. I don't really know who uh, David Smith is, but thank you very much. And dude came back and says, it's hard, to, it's hard to care about sports ball when you don't pay for cable and they bombard you uh, with telling you that you're a bad person for not liking them. Very true. And uh, Chris came in and says, Sports Chat reminded me of the old One Up podcast, uh, The Sports Anomaly. There's, I think there's podcast gold to be minded with a regular sports game podcast. Ah, Chris, thank you very much. Uh, that'd be fun. That'd be really, really fun. Um, I, You guys know I love sports. I love sports. Not a huge fan of like sports games, uh, but I, but I understand the fascination with them for sure. All right. Uh, that was awesome. Uh, I, I really enjoyed that conversation. And like I said, he's a super smart dude. Makes me feel smarter. Um, it's great, man. But either way, uh, I appreciate you guys popping in. Thanks to Blabs and thanks to Trav for holding it down on the back end. Trav, keeping an eye on the chat, which, you know, you guys have been super civil today, which is great. Uh, and uh, Blabs for head handling up on social media. We'll get back to our regularly scheduled program tomorrow with side scrollers. And then coming up in about 30 minutes from now, 45 minutes, I'm playing Yoshi's Island. Um, look, this game has broke me. Broke me in the worst possible way. Um, I need you guys to show up today. Um, this is, I'm literally doing the exact same thing I did yesterday because I'm an idiot and I uh, chose to load a save point instead of save a new save, save point. It was a horrible, horrible point. But either way, um, it was bad. So I look forward to seeing you guys in about 45 minutes. Uh, over on Rumble and on YouTube and on Twitter and on Twitch. I'll be live pretty much everywhere. Uh, look forward to seeing you guys then. Thanks so much for popping in. Remember, people are going to try to keep you down. Don't let them. You guys got a goal. Go get it. I'll see you guys.